Greetings, Dr. Mark Winton here from the Department of Criminal Justice at the University of Central Florida. And what I'd like to do in this video is to reflect somewhat on our current state um, and violentization theory and looking back at some research and then trying to apply it to what's going on today. Um, first of all, it's um, July, I think it's the 22nd. Uh, 2002. At least I know the year so uh, and the month. So it's toward the end of July 2022 and um, I'm looking back at an article that I presented at the, um, uh, a the 2019 annual meeting of the Homicide Research Working Group in Clearwater Beach back in May of 2019 called Rapid Onset of the Violentization Process, a case study of serial and mass murder during genocide. Okay, so um, my interest here was a case study of an individual who moved basically, it seemed like, from a law-abiding citizen without a criminal history to a genocidal perpetrator. And looking at the stages of violentization that uh, Professor Lonnie Athens discusses in his um, articles and books and wondering can stages be skipped how are they skipped how does fast does the process work violentization and uh, now I'm thinking about the violentization process and everyday life in the United States and how do we study it but even more importantly how do we stop it prevent it and reverse it so two books I'll just um, mention real quick that are just, I mean, there's a lot of books out there, but this, um, Richard Rhodes, Why They Kill, this is a classic, if you ask me. This is, this is the book to read, um, and published by Vintage Books back in 1999. You guys remember the 90s? Yep. Anyway, this is the book that I got a hold of accidentally at a place called Borders Bookstore, where they had bookstores years ago, with paperback books, and I, I just kind of got this, read it, and and that's when it hit me. I said, whoa, I need to understand more about Dr. Lonnie Athens' work. Here's one of his recent books, second edition, The Creation of Dangerous and Violent Criminals, Lonnie H. Athens. Um, this explained it best to me after having spent years working in the field, cases involving violence and sex crimes, and then teaching and doing research, and then moving into the area of genocide. Uh, Professor Athens tested out his theory on uh, people who engaged in violence, and including prisoners who um, had been convicted of, um, uh, of, of violent crimes. And so violentization theory, I think, is something that's so relevant to look at right now. How do people become violent perpetrators? Whether you're looking at school shootings, you're looking at bullying, you're looking at road rage, you're looking at um, uh, robberies with uh, violence and, and, and domestic uh, violence. Um, how do we explain all this? And asking the big question, have we become more violentized? Okay, so we see, you know, an increased homicide rate in the last few years, especially in some cities, we've seen a huge increase. That should be alarming. Now, obviously, if you ask me as a researcher in criminal justice, I'll tell you half the time I don't know what's going on because there's so much variables I can't control and I don't know the exact effects of that, although we're getting some great research looking at that. You know, for example, the effects of COVID and um, and 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 how the employment unemployment scenarios the lockdown the additional stresses and strains how that you know affected ev everyone um i'm pretty much an introvert so you know staying at home away from people did not have a negative effect on me but i'm sure based on what i've read and what i've heard it had a devastating effect on on many people and we need to study that. We need to figure out. There seems to be, I don't know, tension. You can feel it. When I walk outside in, in the Orlando area, uh, yeah, it's humid. I, but I also feel there's like tension. Tension in the air um, just between people. It just seems, uh, especially driving. 
driving around. Um, and you know what? I talk to people in other states, and they report the same thing, the sa similar experiences. And I'm wondering, have we, let's go ahead and go through those stages and then think about how that works right now. So uh, Dr. Athens talked about how people become violent perpetrators going through several stages. I'm not going to go into detail. You can look on some of my other uh, videos here that go into a lot more detail about violentization theory. But basically, the first stage is brutalization or observing violence. The second stage is defiance or developing a supportive belief system for the use of violence. The third stage is uh, violent dominance engagement, which is participating in violent behavior. The fourth stage is virulency, which is defining oneself as a violent person. And the fifth stage is violent predation, which is extreme violent behavior. Now, most people don't get to those last few stages, fortunately, but think about the first stage, brutalization, observing violence. Um, I've spent my whole career studying violence in some form and you know um, I've seen violence uh, when I was in undergraduate I um, worked part-time in a nightclub and I saw barroom brawls and fights occur usually at you know 1 30 a.m. 2 a.m. when the bar closed and people intoxicated frustrated and bad moods and um, you know I just kind of hide try to stay away from all that. Um, but I watched it, and I had some really, really good discussions. Uh, I think really the first group that educated me on, on violence, understanding violence, were the bouncers that worked at these nightclubs. I, I, I had um, a couple friends that were bouncers. I wasn't, you know, obviously a bouncer, but my friends were, and I was able to talk to them, and I was starting to study violence back then in the um, 80s, early 80s, you know. And, and he told me about a process going on, but nothing made sense. I work in the field. I worked in the field with cases um, uh, of uh, children, adolescents, and adults who were involved in violent situations. And again, trying to figure out well, how did they come to that point? You, you know, uh, you know. For example, um, I had a 16-year-old uh, student who uh, comes in to see us, and she just got expelled from school for slugging a teacher in the face. Um, okay, well, how did she get to that point? What, you know, had other cases of domestic violence uh, where arrests were made and court cases are going on, lots of cases of, of, of different sex crimes. And I always wondered, you, you know, it's not like someone wakes up and decides to be a perpetrator. There's a process. And I think that's where Lonnie Athens really gives us that insight. So I started applying this to also uh, bullying, to sex crimes, um, to genocide, to terrorism, and it all made sense. It made sense to me, and so, of course, we have to go out there and test it. But the big question is, okay, so people observe violence. Uh, it doesn't mean they're going to become violent. I've talked to people who observed a lot of violence, and they say because they observed so much, it made them peaceful, nonviolent individuals that try to do all they can to prevent others from being victims of a violent behaviors. But there's the risk of defiance, the second stage, which is developing that supportive belief system to use violence. People start talking about that. I'm seeing more of that, and I think a lot of that's the online nature of things, where um, people just fly off the handle or, or fly, you know, just lose their, their temper and everything in online discussions. I mean, I noticed that in some of the online groups I, I'm in and the local community. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not saying I'm shocked. It's just I'm surprised it's come to that. But, I, you know, it wouldn't have been like that. Uh, I'll give you an example of um, two people arguing about some moot point, and they start calling each other just really derogatory names. I mean, in a public forum in the community. And, I'm, and I thought, well, they wouldn't do that in person. And, and then you start going to school board meetings or city council meetings and seeing this stuff go on. And... Um, I remember the first time uh, at our local city council meetings, I heard that police officer had to be there because there was a fight. And that was so unusual. And I thought, what a waste of money to have an officer there at a city council meeting. People don't get antagonistic. People don't get aggressive. People don't fight. I was young. 
back then and um, didn't realize what was coming. And I don't think a lot of times we see this, but the signs are there. Um, and then the violent dominance engagement where, where people start participating in violent behavior. And um, it can occur rapidly or it can occur over a long period of time. But, uh, and we've seen that with, with the um, shooters that we've seen in the supermarkets and the schools that there were all kinds of red flags, as they say, that, um, that things were going terribly wrong in their lives. And, and that they had a fascination about violence. They had fantasies and, and imagery of, 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 of harming others, of killing others, of getting revenge. And, um, and, and they planned this, you know, um, working on a case study on Brevik, Anders Brevik, and the planning he went through before his mass murder just boggles the mind. And a lot of times we look back and we say, what could have we done differently? Well, there's a lot of things we could have done differently. Earlier on, early intervention, um, we may be able to um, prevent. And we do prevent. Um, I'm a very strong supporter of the red flag laws. But we need to make sure we're doing adequate follow-up and we're getting the person the help they, they would need. And we're monitoring. Um, you know, if someone's at a risk to themselves or others, we're going to prevent homicide. We're going to prevent suicides. Um, and then the, the, the fourth stage virulency is where someone defines oneself as a violent and dangerous person. They're at that point now, they're engaging in all kinds of violent activities. They're a danger to the community. They're a danger to others. And then the violent predation stage is basically they've gone to the extreme levels of, of, of violence. So we see a lot of this. And I'm wondering, you know, I wish I had tried to come up with a method of tracking violentization stages and some kind of, you know, gauge or feeling of intensity of it and prominence of it, distribution of it throughout time. And, and I started looking at genocides. Okay, that wasn't my first area of study, genocide. I already t said, you know, I started out working in the sex crimes field. And, um, you know, I started studying genocide already 22 years ago. It seems just like yesterday. Um, and, <laughs> you know, this is, I'm looking at historical cases. I'm not a historian, so who knows how many historical, you know, errors I make trying to, you know, research-wise, trying to go about my business. But all of a sudden I start tracking and tracing, looking at these cases, doing, trying to do intense case study analysis. And, and, and thinking about, my gosh, you know, we have group violentization. And what struck me at a very, uh, uh, you know, interesting point in my career is, you know, I teach classes like sex crimes, serial murder, criminal profiling, um, uh, mental disorders and crime, uh, even theory and research methods when needed. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm teaching all these and two courses on genocide, a grad and undergrad. Uh, any, anyway, um, no one really cares about the courses I've taught. But what you, you, you might find interesting is one semester I was teaching serial murder and I was teaching genocide. And well, I've taught those courses prior to that. Well, for some reason, all of a sudden I'm... You know, I'm thinking to myself, okay, wait a minute. Where's the overlap? There is overlap. Uh, which course should this material go in? And I'm thinking to myself, I'm studying this case, this genocide case, and I'm studying three people that are all basically serial killers. And then I'm wondering, do we ever discuss genocide in in serial murder courses. And, and so I started wondering, you know, if I go to a conference on serial murder, are there genocide researchers there? If I go to a conference on genocide, are there serial murder researchers there? Where's the overlap? And that's where I started looking at rapid violentization theory and using Lonnie Athens' work, which is really helpful and informative, and also using uh, Richard Rhodes' work, and also um, was very helpful, you know, um, uh, there's a a film out, a documentary, Why They Kill. Um, you, you know, if you really want to see just a superb, excellent um, 
overview and and um, a violentization theory, an explanation of how how and why violence is occurring now and and what we can do about it. Get a hold of why they kill the documentary why they kill. Let me see if I if I can find that. Oh yeah, I know, I know I'm not supposed to walk around while I'm this is why they kill the creation of dangerous violent criminals based on the book by the Pulitzer Prize winner Richard Rhodes. And um and this is uh this is an older video I, I I'm sorry, a um, CD I have of the video, but, but I mean, uh, this, this is it. Uh, I would encourage everyone to take a look at why they kill. See if you can find that online somewhere. And, um, you can go to www.sanguefilms.com. Uh, so, um, at saying, at films.com um, that's that's really in, in, in I think you know that that's really going to inform us a lot and and dr. Athens and his colleagues do some research violentization here but dr. Athens also started doing research on interventions you know different interventions at different stages and what we can do and um, I think that's so important and I'm a very strong a supporter of rehabilitation and um because if we're not rehabilitating what are we doing what's the point and are we going to prevent um and prevention of course rehabilitation and and prevention um you know if you if you put someone in prison for 10 years for some violent crimes and then you let them out at year you know seven or something like that i hope that they've gone through a lot of hard work to deviolentize and to become a productive citizen, and I'd like to see prevention as as well, um, and how these problems interrelate with others. For example, I don't think I've mentioned the um, opium epidemic. It's obviously integrated into our homicide rates problem, our problems of of. Um, drug overdoses, um, and a host of other social problems. We have to always look at the big picture. Certainly, the use of um, uh, drugs could speed up the violentization process or make that violentization process more intense. And we need more research on that as well. So I'm hoping that some of you who are just starting out in your career start thinking about using violentization theory reading about it, studying it, and seeing if it applies. I've had a couple students who worked with me who wrote some very fascinating uh, articles on, on, on violentization theory and studied it. And um, it's not the um, most prominent theory in criminal justice. I'm not sure why. Of course, I'm biased. It, I think it should be, but <laughs> certainly a lot more prominent. But, you know, even in some theory books, it's missing. And I have to say you know how did you guys neglect that that's terrible get it in there let us evaluate uh, for ourselves and then i also wonder how violentization theory you know how social media and all that encourages that as well so there's a lot of changes um yeah i'm at that age now where i go to bed around eight thirty nine o'clock because i'm exhausted and fall asleep like that and then wake up at four or five in the morning and get to work and try to you know see what am i going to do today what research what what problem am i going to address and 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 find myself spending some time doing that obviously some time teaching grading papers you know interacting with colleagues online nowadays <laughs> um and and then thinking about well uh, how does all the social media change things and you know how does this encourage or inhibit the violentization process so we need more research on that on social media and violentization theory 
in my terrorism course, um, we have a section on radicalization through social media and online sources. I mean, wow. And again, a lot of this, um, our understanding of this may be related to what we do, research. Um, certainly, uh, this wasn't, when I was younger, we didn't have internet crimes. Zero. And, and of course, you know the why, right? Yes. Yeah, because I'm older. Old, I'm old, and didn't have internet crimes back then because we didn't have the internet. Uh, but what did we see coming? I mean, I remember working back in 1984 with um, uh, law enforcement. I never worked in law enforcement, so I don't want you to get that impression. I never, ever worked in law enforcement before, but I assisted law enforcement officers sometimes with interviews, with investigations, things of that nature, um, decoding uh, CompuServe transcripts to see where there may be some... Um, illegal behavior going on and, and all that. Um, back in 1984, that's when I first started seeing it. And, uh, you know, I remember explaining to, to officers, I said, hey, look, this, this is a, uh, a child sex crime going on. Here's the phone number of the person who's, uh, you know, they're like, what? Go give them a call. And, you know, a couple weeks later, they call and said, thanks, Mark, that was helpful. You know, and, um, and, and I started seeing that even back then. And then I wondered, you know, where's that going? And then we started seeing all this other stuff. Um, and, and so we, we, we have to study this as well. And, and I think it's, it all fits into what we do as um, in the academic area is, is we, we say, okay, we need to teach about theory. We need to teach about research methods. We need to teach about data analysis and critical thinking skills and you get out there in the field or you're in the field and you want to apply all this and make it useful, make it work. You know, I had one student and in my theory course, I'll never forget. And he said, he said, okay, Mark, you teach us all these theories and everything. Okay. I get a call at three o'clock in the morning and there's a guy in a tree with a gun to his head. How do these theories help me right there? You know, what are you going to do? Get a ladder and go up there with an MMPI and give him some psychological tests? No, of course not. What are you going to do? How are you going to explain this? And my response was, that's a great question. I'm wondering, how did he get to that point? And how could have we prevented it earlier? What were the signs? What were the symptoms? And, and he said, yeah, that would be helpful. And, and so we talk about, you know, what point do we intervene? Or when do we see something terrible has occurred? And, um, you, you know... I hate to be sitting back watching and then saying, see, he told you something. No, we don't want to have those scenarios occur. So how would you use this? Let's go back for a moment and think about, um, I, want, I want you to think about these questions if you'd like. Um, I'm not, I, I have more, more um, questions than, than answers uh, today. So um, that's, I don't know if that's good or bad. I mean, doesn't matter to me. Nice thing is no one's going to be tested on this. But have we become more violentized as a society? Has our community become more violentized? Has social media, how has social media impacted, if at all, the violentization process? You know, brutalization, defiance, violent dominance, engagement, virulency, and violent predation. You know, how has that occurred? I mean, we have increased homicide rate in, in some cities. Okay, what's going on there? Why is it lower in other cities? You know what gets me? People start bringing politics into it. No. That, that doesn't hold, it's not helpful, and, and that's, it's like, you know, I, someone starts arguing with that. You know what? A brick wall is more productive to have a discussion with. Because um, you're not going to get anywhere, but you don't feel bad after the talk. Uh, but no, no, we need to take politics out of this and bring the science in. Because violentization theory, it doesn't go after, you know, politics in that sense. Because this is universal, in my opinion. I've seen this in every genocide I've studied. And it's been very similar, the whole process. And so I'm wondering if this is just universal. And so that's another thing. I hope people that are in other 
uh, countries start using volatilization theory more and studying it. And I've seen some work coming out, for example, of Italy, where, yeah, we're seeing some similarities there. Um, and, and so, uh, again, you know, is it cross-culturally relevant? Um, Volunteization theory doesn't care if you're male or female. Volunteization theory doesn't care if you're you're wealthy or, or, or poor in, in that sense. I mean, there may be factors that influence whether someone engages in violent behavior or not, uh, but it's not... I, what I'm saying, basically, to back up, what I just said probably makes no sense at all. So I'm not saying that... Um, uh, I'm, 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 I'm saying the socialization process. In other words, that males may... Um, be more likely to go through the violentization process than females. But there's nothing inherently about being male or female that would make someone, you know, stuck with going through violentization process, that they can inhibit that, they can prevent that from happening. Um, you know, but we might ask, what is it regarding gender that when influential factors lead to you know, does hypermasculinity relate to the violentization process and, and becoming violent and having a history of violent predation and, be, and behavior? Uh, you know, how does this relate to bullying, the bullies and the um, survivors of bullying? And so, I mean, there's lots, a lot of questions. And then, of course, um, I'll start wrapping things up because I've gone way too long here. Um, you, you know, to think about indicators you know, using these violentization uh, stages and then developing some indicators to study your community. Um, and, and I say your community because you have some local knowledge about what's going on. And communities may vary from um, place to place and also from time to time that um, I've been in my community on and off since I was a, a kid. You know, actually, I run into people I've known like 50 years, and I'm just amazed they still talk to me. That's that's the most pleasing thing I can think of is that someone I run into 50 years later, and we talk and have a great conversation, and, you know, um, that, I think, you know, different time periods and people say, well, remember when, remember when, well, when I was in high school, we didn't have all this, we didn't have, all... yeah, things change. And how do those changes impact? Obviously, violentization theory, I think, is historically relevant. You could go back, um, you could go back to some very old writings and see violentization theory. You could study some conflicts. Um... Uh, the first time I started looking at, at historical aspects was um, a book written by Josephus. Way, 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 way uh, long ago, which I'm not even going to get into. And I, I, I read that book and um, I thought, wow, <laughs> see, about violentization theory applies in there. Violentization theory applies today. Violentization theory applied 10 years ago, 30 years ago. 200 years ago, 500 years ago. And so we have to look at how that fits in with the social changes as well. Um, maybe I made this video because i am been kind of thinking about putting it into a, a short book. Even a publishing company approached me and I'm thinking, I don't have the energy right now to write a book. Books, I don't know. If you've ever written a book before, um, I've co-authored two books, and, and, and they were, yeah, they're, they take a lot of time. My gosh, it's, um, uh, I don't see how a single author does it, but uh, it's tempting because I think that if I can figure out, if we could figure out how to reverse the violentization process, we'd be doing a lot better. We'd have less violence in all domains in societies. So I don't want to end on a um, pessimistic note that things are just going to get worse. Because I'm convinced that we write our scripts. We put on the show here. Things could get better. And so 
we get into the debate, well, what do we do? And, and I think here, using violentization theory, figuring out how do we apply it in the school system? How do we apply it in social services? How do we apply it in our community? How do we apply it in the prisons? Um, how do we reverse it? How do we stop it? So I'm going to wrap up now because this went just a little bit over 30 minutes. So um, if you took the time to listen to this, um, I thank you very much. And and I really hope, you know, um, we can continue this journey trying to figure out if violentization theory, how we can use violentization theory to solve the problems related to our increased violent crime we face every day. Thank you.